Pakistan says Afghan refugees must leave the country by the end of the year. Rights groups say 100,000 people have already been forcibly returned. So why now? How much of this is politics at play? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the show. I'm Sami Zaydan. Well, they weren't born in Afghanistan. They've never lived there. But two and a half million Afghan refugees could now be sent to a land they don't really know. Citing security concerns, Pakistan says the refugees must go to Afghanistan by the end of the year. It's a decision rights groups are calling one of the largest forcible returns of refugees in modern history. Afghan refugees have been living in Pakistan since the early 1980s when they fled the Soviet invasion. Pakistan has hosted more than three million Afghan refugees over the past several decades. The government has repeatedly set and extended deadlines for the refugees to leave. But it says this year is final, calling it a matter of national security. Human rights groups call the decision inhumane and illegal. They say the refugees have no homes or resources in Afghanistan. So lots to discuss with our guests. But first, Kamal Haider has this report from Jalala, a refugee camp in northern Pakistan. Pulling down the roof over their own heads, Amanullah and his family are busy dismantling their mud house to retrieve timbers that supported the roof. He takes us inside to show us what is left. He was a boy when he fled Afghanistan in the early 1980s and made this camp his home. This way he made his new life and raised his family. Now he's a grandfather and four of his sons are married. His children have only heard of Afghanistan and what life there is like. The government has granted us six months extension to leave the country. That's why we have packed all of our belongings to leave before winter. So that way we would be able to find a suitable place in Afghanistan for our kids and family. As we go outside, we see his son Atikula bargaining with a local scrap dealer who offers him less than 5,000 rupees or less than $50 for two old fans a bookshelf and an old bed. The dealer is looking for a bargain. Adikullah's priority is to get some cash quickly to help the family for a few months. He's in no position to drive a hard bargain. Taking all our belongings to Afghanistan would need at least two trucks and cost us double, which we can't afford. So we have decided to sell at lower prices so we can get some money to bear some of our expenses. We asked the dealer if he's not being unfair by offering such low prices. Yes, I admit that we are buying all these items at cheaper prices, but we are not forcing them to sell it to us. Even they are urging us to buy it at lower prices. Afghan refugees are allowed to take their personal belongings with them, but many have opted to sell them to raise much needed money to be able to go back to their country. Kamal Haider Al Jazeera, Jalala refugee camp in Mardan. Let's bring our guests into the show. We have here in the studio Naveed Ahmed, an investigative journalist and security analyst. In Islamabad, we have Hassan Khan, specialist on Afghanistan-Pakistan issues. And in Kabul, Habib Wardak, good governance and anti-corruption activist. Well, Habib himself was a refugee in Pakistan. Welcome to you all. If I could start with Habib. We're told by rights agencies, Habib, that 100,000 people have already returned. It's still a war-torn country. What are people returning back to? First of all, they are returning back to their own country. Whether this country is good or bad, end of the day, that they have to come here. I don't speak for the government over here, but I might be speaking for the general Afghan public. But does it um, seem like most Afghans to want have, to go back, to Habib? Have our own Afghans back in whether whether they want to go back or whether they don't want to go back this is their country and ultimately they they will have to be returning back to this country um, I, I as a refugee I have spent about nine to ten years in, in, in Pakistan when I was a little kid back in early 90s up to early 2002 
2003. Um, as a refugee, Pakistan never could be a country. Um, despite the, um, the, the, the warm heart uh, and welcome shown to us by the, um, by the uh, general Pakistani nation, uh, but it was the policies of the Pakistani government that, ne that never accepted us as, uh, as, human, as humans in Pakistan. Um, whether, whether the refugees uh, want to come or don't want to come, end of the day, this is their country, and we yeah, are but quite hang delighted on, Habib, to have but them what, back. If uh, people country, don't have not much to that... return to, and there aren't uh, proper structures in place to absorb them, to reintegrate them, um, that is a bit of an issue, and might be something worth keeping in mind when we talk about whether they want to return or not, surely. Well, well, they don't have anything, uh, they don't have much either in Pakistan as well. Um, the Pakistani government has been extending their, uh, um, their uh, residence for the past few years, for about six months up to a year. Uh, other, than, uh, other than that, they don't have anything, and then the camps that they, that they are dwelling in, um, they don't have anything else over there as well. Um, uh, what I'm saying is that the refugees could be divided into three categories. A uh, would be the ones who, who have small or medium or big businesses in Kabul. That is a small chunk of uh, refugees in Pakistan. Uh, once they come back, they could, you know, uh, they, they would transfer in the capital as well and they could contribute into the Afghan economy and the society. Um, the second portion would be the ones who are educated in Pakistan, who have skill, um, who, are, uh, who, who could be considered as the Afghan uh, capital, uh, skill capital, and they could contribute into the Afghan construction, reconstruction process as well. And the major chunk would be the ones who are dwelling in, uh, in refugee camps. Um, that is the issue for the Afghan government and for the Afghan general public as well. Um, and that uh, the, uh, the help of the international right. community would be required uh, to assist the Afghan government in providing shelter, uh, water, and food to these refugees. All right, we'll talk about uh, uh, international these, uh, refugees. Uh, agencies uh, but, but and what why, help why they I'm can provide in a moment. Forgive me for, for, for interrupting here, Habib. We'll come back to you. But I want to focus on the point that you made as we take the discussion to Hassan in Islamabad. Now, Hassan, you have worked closely with the refugees. From your perspective, do they share that perspective that we're hearing from Habib, that however bad the situation is in Afghanistan, it's not much better for them in Pakistan? They've never really be, been welcomed by the government, Habib said, no matter how warm the welcome was from the general Pakistani population. Uh, I think uh, uh, Habib has mentioned that uh, he himself lived in Pakistan as a refugee and the Pakistani general public was always good with them, uh, with most of the refugees. I think Pakistan was an ideal country for the Afghan refugees. Me, uh, myself as a Pakistani, uh, I saw the refugees uh, starting from Peshawar, going to Karachi, anywhere in Pakistan, doing any business in Pakistan except the government jobs. I think they were welcome. Nobody uh, uh, treated them uh, badly, uh, even the police and even uh, the, the other law enforcing agencies, they were always uh, respecting the Afghan refugees and that was the reason uh, that majority of the Afghans, uh, 1.6 million are registered and more than that uh, are unregistered and uh, almost on daily basis. Sorry, Hassan, uh, to, to jump to 30, in, uh, uh, Afghans. forgive me for interrupting you, but was it always the case that they were never attacked or harassed? I mean, if you read the Amnesty International report of August 21st, uh, 2016, they say, quote, attacking a group of refugees because they happen to be from the same country where armed groups come from that carry out vile atrocities is a cruel and discriminatory practice, they say. This is uh, the 2016 uh, report, as you mentioned. I'm talking of the Afghan refugees, but now, uh, after the Peshawar school attack in 2014, uh, and later on, another university uh, attack in, uh, in, in Charsada, in Khyber Pakhtunkhwa province, uh, the Pakistani government has come up with a national plan to deal with the issue of terrorism and militancy, and that is called the National Action Plan. And simultaneously, the Afghan government was also putting pressure on the Pakistani government to deal with those Afghan militants who are crossing the border so Pakistan was under pressure uh, definitely one under the uh, this national action plan and two because in national action plan uh, settlement of the refugees issue with the Afghan government was a priority uh, agenda item uh, and the same when the Afghan government was repeatedly calling the Pakistani government that anything happening in Afghanistan is done by the Taliban and Taliban are residing in the provinces of Balochistan and Khyber Pakhtunkhwa so definitely the government also uh, give it a serious uh, consideration 
Two, uh, I think uh, the, 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 the way the Afghan government or the, uh, the government, uh, the political leaders, uh, the way they, 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 were, uh, they were treating uh, the Pakistanis or the Pakistani government, uh, definitely there are certain sensibilities for Pakistan, particularly going close to India. So Pakistan uh, took a decision that one, all the illegal refugees, mean the non-registered refugees in Pakistan, must be sent back without any, without giving them any, uh, any more uh, time. And All to right. the unregistered refugees, as we mentioned, as right. mentioned, that several times they were giving. All right. Since you've mentioned there the attack on the Afghan school, like I guess Habib, we will come back to you in a moment. Bear with us for a second, Habib. But since um, Hassan mentioned there the attack on the school, perhaps it's a good time to sort of uh, recap things. Pakistan did, of course, toughen its approach to Afghan refugees after that Peshawar school attack in December 2014. Just to remind ourselves, that's when more than 140 students and staff at the army public school were killed. Now, the main suspect of that attack was killed in Afghanistan more than two years later, the Pakistani government saying refugee camps near the Afghan border are a security threat. They must be shut down, they started saying, to protect Pakistani citizens. And I'm wondering, Naveed, this is, well, the official line has increasingly become in Pakistan that these camps are a security issue, they're becoming a, a border control issue. How much of this is really security and how much of it is politics because of souring relations between Kabul and Peshawar? Well, uh, security issue is very much there. Uh, Pakistani government, uh, when the influx started, did not register them. They came everywhere. One day, one morning, I woke up in Multan and we went to play and the playground was all tents and uh, whatever kind of tents you can imagine, impoverished people living there. And we started our youth, our childhood with the Afghans. We shared our schools, we shared the hospitals and almost everywhere. And But the police, the government treated us and them at the same time level. There was no discrimination per se until right. you enter 2014 uh, when Peshawar incident happens. Over the years, uh, there has been uh, a feeling in Pakistan that Pakistan's economy is being uh, punished by the Americans and the West for having a nuclear weapon or having some issues with the United States policy or Western policy. Uh, while we were as a country housing three million or more uh, Afghan refugees. So that was the context in which the public opinion and the government's understanding started uh, stiffening up. Much of that happens in 2013 and 2014, we see. And anything happening inside Afghanistan is blamed on Pakistan as if Afghanistan's corrupt leaders, Hamid Karzai and the following, have outsourced their security, country security to Pakistan and their heart and mind to India or whatever. Okay, but so this on, is where, on, this is where security comes in. Well, for, so, on that point of security, while you know, Pakistani officials today talk about security, security, the camp security, there are many who would say that the militarization, if we can call it that, of camps, of turning uh, some of those Afghans into fighting groups, into even the Taliban, started with or is connected to the operations or activities of Pakistan's intelligence ISI in those very camps that they're complaining about today. Is there not some truth? ISI there? is too small to carry out uh, the militarization of three million uh, well, where refugees. Where did the Taliban uh, emerge May from? May I respond? Mm. There is no doubt that United States, Afghan dissidents uh, uh, of all yani, uh, stature were agreeing on the fact that there should be resistance against the Soviets. Moving no, on, the Taliban it was long I, after the it's not, withdrew. The history it was doesn't the start after 2001. Were, were fighting if, each other in Kabul. That's when history we History doesn't begin from 2001, mm -hmm. uh, when uh, 2001, when 9/11 happens. History begins when Soviets invade an independent country, whatever mm -hmm. type it was, and people started coming here and calling Pakistan a home. That's very important correction to be made. The indoctrination of militarization of the minds of Afghans and Pakistanis started with the blessing of CIA, United States, the West, and also the, uh, the regional players in the GCC and elsewhere. Moving on, since 2002 particularly and 2004 more stringently, Pakistan was part of a counter-terror campaign, which, paid, uh, which was carried out inside and also helped Afghanistan and uh, United States to carry it out. Be beyond that, the blame has been be right. unduly placed. 
As for refugees are concerned, the discrimination that is happening now wasn't there. However, the understanding was also there that political issues should not be, okay. uh, you know, put on the shoulders of Afghans right, of who have been refugees. excellent people who have contributed right. to Pakistan economy for like 38 years. All right, I could see Habib. I promised him I'd give him a chance to get in because he wanted to comment on something. Go ahead, Habib. Um, uh, I agree with my friend that yes, the uh, the Afghan re refugees contributed a lot into the development of cities like Peshawar, Lahore, Karachi, and and Kuwaita. No doubt about that. But disagreeing to the points uh, that both of my friends made, um, um, I was called a muhajir when I used to go to school in Pakistan. Now, muhajir is a, is a very holy word, and if you look at it into its original context, where the Prophet, peace be upon him, migrated from Mecca to, to Medina. But in Pakistan, it was used as a derogatory term for us. And we used to feel inferior, no doubt about it. And we don't expect much from, from the Pakistani public and the government in, in this context. Because um, the, um, the uh, Indian Muslims who migrated back then uh, in, uh, in mid-1940s, they are still called muhajirs and they are still called um, uh, people from outside. So we don't expect much from them. Uh, speaking in terms of uh, um, the, the Peshawar uh, massacre, which happened in, in, in school, which, which was very unfortunate and inhuman, and the university massacre. Um, yes, the Afghan government has acted upon that um, and have killed the prime suspect. Uh, but I wonder when will uh, uh, the Pakistani establishment uh, take action on uh, what uh, people in Afghanistan did, whose link, whose link is strictly connected to, uh, to people in Pakistan. What happened the other day at the American University of pa uh, Afghanistan? What happened to so many schools in Afghanistan? We haven't seen much uh, as far as that aspect is concerned. And speaking in terms of radicalization, okay, ha I was taught Habib. personally... Naveed, Naveed wants um, to weigh and, in here. I'll give you briefly and, and a chance, Naveed. Yeah, just briefly. Still, just briefly, that Hamid Karzai led I, rhetoric of anti-Pakistan sentiment cannot really serve any discussion. The reality okay. is that the Afghan government hasn't right. done anything to take responsibility it, 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 of the people. There is no plan by Kabul, which is in place, to, to get these people back in their countries or fix the security issues. Uh, you know, the, the, this, uh, police, the rate yes, of transfer uh, of policemen to Taliban every, every year is okay. increasing. All right, all right. Hassan, what I'm wondering, listening to this, is even just, if these people are just, moved back just to... to add, all right, go ahead. Yeah, just to add, uh, just to add my uh, uh, yesterday experience, I visited uh, what, what my friend Habib is, I think, uh, somehow uh, he is trying to exaggerate uh, certain things and maybe he's sitting in Kabul, uh, that may be the, the requirement for most of the Kabul uh, based analysts. But one thing, yesterday I visited the repatriate, the major repatriation center at Chamkani uh, in Peshawar and daily uh, hundreds of uh, families are visiting that camps and now that the UNICEF is trying to formalize them. Uh, believe me, I met a number of families. I interviewed them for my television channel. They are still, uh, they are still reluctant. They still want. They, they say that we are more at home in Pakistan. What this terms at in school, he was called a refugee. I think he knows very well, being in a Pashtun society he himself is a Pashtun. So today, yesterday, uh, the, the refugees who are in Pakistan, who by the, 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 way, the way they say that so police Hassan, is persecuting why isn't them, citizenship are they an option for the, them? some of these but people if 70% of the refugee population is born and bred in Pakistan? Yeah, they are they're born and bred in Pakistan. And as I think as Kamal Haider in his report, yesterday I interviewed a number of families. The elder one who migrated to Pakistan, he married here, he has a son, and now he has a grandchildren. And believe Should me, most of the women, they be were weeping. a possible solution we for some of these people then? Citizenship cannot be a possibility uh, because Pakistan an does not adhere to uh, the UNHCR clauses which uh, impinge on Pakistan or any country uh, to offer uh, citizenship. Uh, countries like Turkey or Pakistan, they do not. Mostly they are European or Australia or New Zealand or some countries probably uh, in Latin America. Pakistan is not a member okay, to the convention. Is there, is there return legal? Because according to... Some well, human rights groups. Initially, it was it was very open-ended. Pakistanis never registered okay. anyone. But after 9/11, there was a registration of Pakistani nationals, and follow-up was to register all other people who are living here, including Afghans. Yeah, but that my, is where the registration is, process. Amnesty comes. International said in its report for repatriation, I'm quoting now, to be lawful, it must be truly voluntary. It doesn't seem like this is voluntary. I agree with that, and I think there is more of rhetoric on the 
uh, on the, uh, the Ghani and uh, Abdullah government side and Dostum, who's a war criminal, that is really having bearings on Afghan people. Those politicians in Kabul do not do anything for the people of Afghanistan except for themselves. Okay. Pakistanis, right. Hang on. That's, let's, that's, let's that's me complete. Point. That's let's me point. complete. Pakistanis' Briefly. reaction if, if to that is not realistic. Three million or 1.7 million people cannot be uh, repatriated in like one month or two Beautiful. years. Beautiful. That was the point I was going to take to Habib in Kabul and say, I know that you're all for the return of refugees, but really three million people by December of this year is that practical? That is not practical. That is not pra practical uh, in Afghanistan, and that is not practical. Uh, so, in, what in happens many to these countries? people if you do get three uh, million so people back in Afghanistan? Both the countries are going to press for it. Right, let's give They're going to fight chance. on that this. Is why I, uh, that is why, um, and that is why I say the international community, the United Nations, uh, um, the, the UNHCR in specific, should come uh, and contribute and support this process. Um, but, but, but is that whether happening, we are Habib? ready for it, are you getting are uh, enough help it, from international um, they agencies? Will be we, we are hopeful, yes, let we are me, hopeful, uh, let, but, let but, but look at it. Uh, the okay, Pakistani hang on, Hassan, we'll has come to you. Let Habib it. finish the thought. Briefly, uh, Habib. Uh, the Pakistani the, the Pakistani establishment has been saying, has been extending uh, uh, their residence for the past few years for about six months, nine months, ten months. Um, let me make my two points very clear that uh, the Pakistani establishment has Quickly, been using please, uh, uh, mainly three tools over the past 15 years to pressurize uh, the Afghan government. A, refugees. B, transit. Three, terrorism. Transit has been solved to, uh, up to a lot of extent with the opening of Chabahar port. Refugees issues are still there and terrorism is still there. I mean, I was a refugee back in 1990s. Okay, what was your second uh, point? Like I say, cats do not ca catch mice to please God. Um, I, was, I was taught in a Pakistani refugee camp, J for Jihad, while Pakistani kids were, were, were taught J for Jackal. I was taught A for Allah, while Pakistani kids were taught A for Apple. And this is where radicalization of Pakist uh, Afghani refugees in Pakistan started. As the, as right. the former king, Ziaul Haq, stated it, that jihad in Pakistan defy Afghanistan where if you, if, you, if you support the jihad in Afghanistan, Pakistan will be protected. Okay, so okay. You've made, you've made of, that, you've made that uh, point. We've got Pakistan two and a half minutes left. I want to give when a chance to Hassan. When it started, Let's give a chance to Hassan when it started Habib, backfiring, they started registering it. All right, Hassan, go ahead. There is, there, is a mis, uh, there is a misconception, I think. Pakistan is not forcefully sending these refugees back. Even today, there is a statement from the governor of Khyber. But they don't seem, Kumbhwa, sorry, Hassan, they don't seem to be leaving gradual, on their own accord. It is a voluntary process. The UN voluntary and program can, has repatriated 5,000 since January. How can, how can we expect 3 million to go in the next six months voluntarily, if only 5,000 yeah, have gone that's, in the first that, that, that's, that's what I'm saying. <laughs> That, that's what I'm saying today. The governor of Khyber Pakhtunkhwa, he has said, there's, there's a news uh, uh, in the newspaper, yesterday he has given an interview, where he says that we may extend uh, this December 16 to further six months. And I think this is, this is the way that the government is trying to tell the refugees that, as, as my friend Habib said, that they are refugees, they, can't, they can never be Pakistani. So the government is giving them a space gradually that your time is finishing, please go back. But they never know where there is an arrest of the legal refugees uh, this totally voluntary there is a statement from the prime minister a statement from most of the political leader even the Khyber Pakhtunkhwa the, the Pakistan Tehreek and Saab chief uh, Imran Khan and all the religious parties and all the nationalist parties they are convincing the government and the government has agreed that there will be no right. forceful return of the refugees they were uh, yeah Naveed, Naveed wants to, well, I think we've got 60 seconds That's, left and Naveed's angling to get in, so go ahead. 60 this seconds, UNHCR Naveed. is spending $200 million a year, which is far less. $200 million to repatriate or educate or give them money to go home. It's not realistic. The thing is, until Kabul really starts thinking about these people as human resource, uh, the issue will not be resolved. There is no plan in Kabul as to how these people will come and uh, be, uh, d uh, be located in their places. Reconstruction right. will start. Secondly, okay. the rhetoric against Islamabad is, re is uh, being uh, used to punish the refugees. All right, Pakistan have, will not realistically we'll be able to, to let them go. All right, we are out of time, I'm afraid. I'm sorry, we, we will have to leave things there. I know we could go on discussing this, but... Uh, perhaps in another episode. For now, let's thank our guests very much here in the studio, Naveed Ahmed, Habib Wardak, and Hassan Khan.
And thank you too for watching. You can see the show again anytime by visiting our website, aljazeera.com. And for further discussion, head over to our Facebook page. That's facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. You can also join the conversation on Twitter. Our handle there is at AJ Inside Story. Well, from me, Sami Zaydan, and the whole Inside Story team here for now, thanks for watching and goodbye.